Thank you. Um, so first, let me apologize. I lost my voice uh, yesterday. Um, so that's why I sound like this. So hopefully uh, you can hear me and it's not too, too horrible. Um, so we'll see how far I can make it through the talk. I'll probably skip some parts um, to try to keep it a little bit shorter than, uh, than what I planned. So this is a project. Uh, it's joint work with Tariq Moataz and Martin Zhu. Um, so the project is called Pixec. And so uh, I think at this point it's pretty obvious that we have a problem with data breaches. Um, you know, I don't have to go through all the different examples, you know, the big ones like Equifax, Yahoo, et cetera. Uh, pretty much every industry has been affected by this. Healthcare, government, um, political organizations. Um, and I found some statistics and it, you know, uh, at least one place said that since 2013, there's been uh, 9 billion records that have been leaked as a result of data breaches. And interestingly, uh, they also said that only 4% of those records had been encrypted. Okay, so as a cryptographer, uh, the first thing that you think of is, okay, well, you know, why were so few records encrypted? And so we can speculate, you know, um, as far as what the reasons could be. So one of them could be maybe, uh, you know, people are incompetent, right? That could be one possibility. Or maybe they're lazy, that's another possibility. Uh, or it could be that it's just very expensive uh, to encrypt these records, right? And I don't really know the answer to this question. It's probably a mix of many different things, right? It's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated question. But there was one quote in the New York Times that I found interesting. This is by uh, John Bonforte uh, from Yahoo. This was an executive at Yahoo. And at the time of the Yahoo leak, um, the New York Times asked him why Yahoo didn't encrypt its records. And the answer that he gave is he said because it would have hurt Yahoo's ability to index and search messages. So is this the only reason that records aren't encrypted? No, right? As I said, there's probably many different reasons, but at least this quote suggests that this is one possible reason in some cases, okay? So this, of course, naturally uh, motivates the question, can we search unencrypted data, right? Because maybe if uh, we could, then some of these breaches, or some, you know, some number of these breaches, I don't know what percentage, uh, could have been prevented. So it turns out that we can search on encrypted data. Sorry, so I have, okay. Not everything is coming up on the slides. But so, yeah, so we can search on encrypted data. Uh, we have many different techniques and approaches to do this. Um, one approach is called property preserving encryption, uh, which includes things like deterministic encryption and order preserving encryption. We could also use functional encryption. Uh, there's something else called structured encryption. We could use fully homomorphic encryption, and we could also use oblivious RAM, okay? So we have many different techniques and approaches that we could use to solve this problem. But what's really important to understand is that all of these different techniques provide different trade-offs, okay? So there's no kind of like magic solution to this problem. You either have to, you know, so, so there's different trade-offs. One trade-off is between efficiency and functionality. Another one is between efficiency and security in the form of leakage, right? Because all of these techniques leak something. The question is how much do they leak and how much are you willing to leak in order to achieve performance, okay? So these are the kinds of things that you have to think about um, when you're evaluating a solution for this problem of searching unencrypted data. That's very, very important. So, this is a field that's evolved uh, really starting in 2001, so it's like 17 years old at this point. And, you know, we've sort of done a lot. I think it's a, you know, it's a pretty, it's starting to be a pretty mature field. Um, here, I only have some, you know, some of the steps um, for, oh, sorry, so, I only have some of the steps uh, for some of the more efficient um, approaches. So, for example, with property preserving encryption, we had uh, deterministic encryption and order preserving encryption in 06 and 09, the first proofs for order preserving encryption in 11. Um, we actually had systems built based on these primitives in 2012, the CryptDB system. Um, Microsoft is using deterministic encryption um, in SQL Server. And in 2015, uh, we also published attacks um, as well. Um, and there was a recent paper by um, Kevin Louis and David Wu on how to use or how to design property preserving encryption schemes that uh, can provide security against a snapshot adversary. And you know, that's a particularly interesting development, I think, because uh, they actually argue, and, you know, and I think it's a reasonable argument that property preserving encryption could be useful uh, for that particular adversarial model. Um, 
at least with their, with their schemes. Um, so what's interesting here is that we have, you know, constructions and we have attacks as well. We have a form of cryptanalysis and we also have some systems, okay? And the same thing exists for all of the different approaches. We, we have this for Oblivious RAM as well. We had the seminal work of Golak and Ostrowski in 96 on ORAM. We had uh, these great constructions by Stefanov and Xi, tree-based ORAM, path ORAM. We have systems based off of these, um, Oblivious Store, Obliv P2P, Tao Store. We had some recent uh, cryptanalysis as well in 2016. And in the, in the third world of, uh, of structured encryption, and I put this in red box because the work that I'm gonna talk about today is based um, on that approach. Uh, we had early work in 2001 um, on SSE, and then we have structured encryption. We had cryptanalysis starting in 2012. Uh, the first system is CS2. This is systems that we, that we built at Microsoft Research. Um, and we have other systems like OSPeer. Well, this is sort of the name I'm giving you. This is a system from IBM Research. Um, blind Sierra from Columbia, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think we've made a lot of progress and we've had some interesting results. And I think the exciting bit is that we actually have systems, at least research kind of prototypes built. Um, so as I mentioned, the work I'll talk about today is based on structured encryption. And so I'll just give a very high level view of how this works. So the idea is that, so we have a client that has a set of documents and we have a cloud server that's untrusted. And what the client is gonna do is the client will take its data, right, its documents, and it's gonna encrypt the documents using a standard encryption scheme, something like AES. And then it's gonna produce an encrypted data structure, okay? And that's that little blue box thing with the data structure in it, okay? So this is a data structure. It allows us to search, right? Um, you can think of it, it could be a hash table or a search tree or whatever you want. Um, but it's encrypted, okay? So the data structure is encrypted and you can also query this data structure using encrypted queries, okay? So the client will send the encrypted documents and the encrypted data structure to the cloud and at a later point in time, when the client wants to query its data, it generates a token, that's that TK. And this token basically encapsulates the query that the client wants to make, okay? So the client sends this token to the cloud, the cloud is gonna take the encrypted data structure and the token, it's gonna combine them in some way and the result of that is going to be uh, pointers into the encrypted documents that it needs to return, okay? And then it just returns those encrypted documents. So the point here is that the cloud only sees the encrypted documents, the encrypted data structure, and the tokens, okay? It doesn't see anything else. And at a later point in time, if the client wants to update the data structure, it can send an update token. That's the UTK there, okay? So that's, that's sort of at a high level um, what we do. Okay, and um, of course there's gonna be, depending on the solutions that you choose, there's gonna be more or less leakage at these different stages. Okay. So um, before I, I keep going, so I mentioned, you know, I motivated this by saying that we have a problem with data breaches, and, and we do, um, but you know, you can also ask a reasonable question, which is, well, would encryption really prevent breaches anyways, right? And you know, it, data breaches occur using, in many different ways, right? Um, sometimes people use phishing to get people's passwords and credentials. Uh, sometimes, you know, people pick weak passwords and you can have a dictionary attack. Or somebody could just steal the data, right, off your server. And so encryption is not going to help with everything, but it'll help with some of these, some of these data breaches. Okay, so that's sort of um, as much as I want to claim. So we have this technology, which is uh, encrypted search with all these different approaches. We have systems that we've built, at least research prototypes that we've built. We've done, we started doing some cryptanalysis on these things. And so I think the natural question is, can these, you know, can these schemes or can this cryptography be deployed, right? Um, and that's, that's not an obvious question. And when you talk to people about this, you get all kinds of reactions, right? So some people are like really optimistic and they say, of course, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be awesome and it's gonna change everything. And then some people are very negative and they say, oh, it'll never happen, it's all broken, it's all bad. Right, um, so you get a little bit of everything. Um, so what we decided to do with Tariq and with Martin is that we said, well, let's, let's see for ourselves, right? Let's see if we can actually deploy something. And so we looked at kind of the space of end-to-end encryption and we saw that, you know, we're doing really well on messaging, right? We have a lot of really great end-to-end encrypted apps, right? Obviously like Signal, WhatsApp, um, you know, we have like Facebook Messenger, um, and we also, we're doing sort of okay on video, right? We recently learned that Skype is gonna get um, end-to-end -end encryption, FaceTime already has it. So I think we're doing, this is really exciting, right? We actually have real-world 
and to unencrypted apps, um, at least for, for messaging and for video. But one thing that we didn't find is um, encrypted apps for photos, right? So this is an estimate that I got. In 2017, the estimate is that there were 1.2 trillion photos, digital photos taken. And 85% of those were on smartphones, 4% uh, on tablets, and 10% on digital cameras, okay? And, you know, something interesting about photos, and especially people's photo collections, is that one thing is that they're very large, right? If you're anything like me, you have tons and tons of pictures. Um, they also have, you know, high sentimental value, right? Like these may be pictures of your family, of your kids, your parents, etc. You really, really care about these pictures, right? The thought of losing any one of them is actually like a big deal. And so what that motivates, right, it makes, I, th I think this suggests that people want to store their photos on the cloud, at least I do, right? This is something that, um, that I do because the cloud, of course, has, you know, a lot of storage, right? You can store a lot on the cloud, more than on your phone, and also the cloud will back up your data, right? Um, so you have a smaller chance of losing, your, of losing your pictures. But photos are also private, right? These are like personal moments between you and your family, you and your friends, et cetera. And you don't necessarily want everybody to see them, right? Uh, sometimes you have really goofy pictures with your friends, you know, you don't want like your students to see you like, you know, like with a beer or something, I don't know. So, Encryption actually makes sense in this setting as well, right? You also want to protect the privacy of your pictures. So um, there are also other reasons, right? Another reason is, for example, in 2014, Edward uh, Majerschik hacked 30 Gmail accounts um, and iCloud accounts and was able to get 500 private pictures and leak them, okay? And these included, you know, very sort of compromising pictures of many different celebrities, right? And you probably heard about this. This is actually like all over the news. Um, but even if you're not worried about data breaches, even if that's not your concern, maybe your job requires you um, to have very sensitive photos, right? Maybe you're a journalist or a photojournalist, and your pictures are very, you know, are very sensitive, and you want to avoid censure, right? Um, or maybe you're an activist, okay? And you take pictures, you have pictures that uh, can show certain acts or shows government abuse, right? Um, those pictures are very, are very important for the world to see, and you want to protect them. You could be a citizen journalist, right? In some parts of the world, the only journalists that really, you know, that are actually on the ground are just regular citizens with smartphones, okay? Um, so, sort of, the point I'm trying to make here is that I think there's many reasons why you would want to protect your photos, right? I think this is a well-motivated problem. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, well, let's try and see if we can build an app right, to protect photos, an end-to-end -end encrypted app. And so basically that's what PixSec is, it's an end-to-end -end encrypted camera app. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like, at least right now. So the first uh, screenshot is basically our, you know, the, the login screen, you put your email, your password. Uh, the middle one is, you know, taking a picture, right, so it just looks like a regular photo app. And the third one is your, um, your photo collection, okay? And here everything is, back, everything is encrypted and backed up on the cloud, okay? It's end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, the key stays on your device, but we have a few additional features uh, to, that, we think are, that we think are interesting. Um, so as building blocks, we use um, Clusion, which is an encrypted search library that we built um, at Brown, and this has all the state-of-the-art uh, searchable encryption schemes, um, and we have some new ones that uh, we've sort of, that are under, that we've designed, they're under submission, they're not published yet, uh, but we have the implementations for, uh, for some of them already, so we're going to include those. Uh, we also use TensorFlow, which is an open source machine learning library from Google, and we use GeoMobile, which is a, a geolocation database, and I'll explain exactly how these components fit, um, fit together. So, um, this is a, a statue called Lamp Bear, and this is on the Brown campus, not too far from the Computer Science Building, it's a massive statue, it's like 23 feet tall. Um, why we have this on campus, I'm not exactly sure, but, but, you know, but we do. And so, suppose that one day you're, you know, you're walking on the Brown campus and you take a picture of Lamp Bear, right? So, the way that the app is gonna work is that you're gonna take a picture, and the first thing that the app is gonna do is it's gonna downsample, so it'll create a thumbnail, essentially, something smaller. And then it's gonna encrypt that thumbnail, okay? Then it's gonna take the picture and it's gonna encrypt the picture. Okay, so, so far, um, this is pretty straightforward. 
The third thing it's going to do is it's going to use TensorFlow, which is Google's machine learning library, to figure out what is in this picture. Okay, so in this case, it would figure out that there's a bear and there's a lamp. You know, maybe it'll figure out that there's something blue as well, right? Um, at this point, the app is also going to use is also going to add a tag with the picture's geolocation. Okay, so it knows that where you are on campus, you're in Providence. Okay, so it adds Providence, Rhode Island. And finally, you have the option of adding your own tags. You can modify previous tags, or you can add your own. In this case, maybe you, you add a tag, Brown University, okay? So once all the tags are generated for this picture, um, each tag is encrypted. Uh, this is actually, the reason we do this is not um, for, well, it's kind of for a special reason, maybe I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, but the interesting bit is that these tags are then uh, used to produce update tokens, okay? And these are uh, the tokens that I was referring to before. So, uh, right, I should have mentioned on the right, on the right-hand side, we have the cloud, right? So we have servers running on the cloud. We don't make any assumptions about, about the cloud. We're, we're, we're using um, Amazon's cloud. We have uh, EC2 servers, and we're using S3 for storage, and we have that encrypted data structure for every user stored there, okay? So, once the tags are created, we generate update tokens for the encrypted structure, and then everything gets sent to the cloud. So the, the encrypted thumbnail, the encrypted picture, the encrypted um, keywords all get sent to S3, and these tokens get sent to EC2, okay? And then we update this encrypted data structure with these tokens. And the point is that everything is encrypted here, okay? So our servers don't actually see anything. And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, leakage later. Okay, so so far so good. Does this kind of make sense? Um, okay. So then, when you want to, so so now you know um, all your pictures are stored in the cloud, right? Uh, maybe you, we, so we we cache some of them on your device, but let's say the vast majority are in the cloud and they're encrypted. But now maybe you want to search over your photo collection. Maybe you want to retrieve all the pictures from summer you know, 2003 or something, right? Or all pictures, you know, from Providence, Rhode Island. So what you do is you say, okay, well, I want to retrieve all the pictures with, with the bear in it, and what we're going to do is we're going to generate a search token for bear, okay? And then we're going to send that to our servers, and uh, the cloud is then going to take this token, combine it with the encrypted data structure, find the encrypted picture that it needs to return, and send back the thumbnail, okay, which is encrypted, that gets decrypted, into the thumbnail. Um, so this gets your at least a snapshot or a thumbnail very quickly. Um, and in the background, we also send right, the, the full picture as well. So it's encrypted, it gets sent back, it gets decrypted at the server. Sorry, there's some items missing from the, from the slide here. So, uh, but hopefully you can see the difference between the cloud and uh, the client, even though it's not sort of showing on the screen. Um, so that's roughly what's going on. There's a lot of things that I'm, that I'm not talking about. So, of course, um, caching and crash recovery, password recovery, how to use multiple devices. We also have a local mode in the app. So, you, so if you don't trust the cloud for some reason, even though you know, we're using encryption, if, if for whatever reason you don't want to use the cloud, you can just store everything on your device. Um, that's perfectly fine. So we have this local mode. So the current version that we have, um, you know, so, yeah, so one interesting thing to notice is that this is sort of a streaming process, right? You take pictures kind of one at a time, and then we're going to send them to the cloud. And so this encrypted data structure that we're using has to have um, some, like, stronger properties than, than, than normal. And in particular, it has to have a property that's called forward privacy, okay? So for those of you that are familiar with this field, you'll recognize this, uh, what this property is. I'm not going to get into the details. But I'll just mention that, um, so this was a property introduced by Stefanov, Abamanto, and Xi in 2014 for a long time, or for a few years, I guess. It's a long time in this world. Um, you know, it was a very expensive property to achieve. Like, most of us thought it was expensive, and then in 2016, Raphael Boss actually showed at CCS that you could actually do it efficiently, okay? So this was, like, a really nice result. Um, and so we actually use a forward private scheme uh, we don't use kind of the published state of the art. We sort of uh, designed or we modified a construction uh, by Cash, Jaeger, Jarecki, Jodla, Kravchik, Russ, and Steiner uh, called Python. We modified it to be for private. Uh, this allows us to avoid public key operations and constrained PRFs, um, though the asymptotics of our version are worse than the published state of the art. 
but it, you know, we actually have a trick that we can use. Uh, we haven't implemented it that yet, but we, have, but we have a trick that we can use to make it um, actually like asymptotically optimal as well. So um, that's what we're using. So I was going to go into the details of the, uh, the cache at all construction, but um, yeah, I don't have that much time and my voice is getting worse. So if you're interested in the details, you know, uh, you can just read the cache at all paper and then we'll be happy to describe how we modified it. Um, it's not, it's really a small change. So um, yeah, I'll mention also we're sort of in the process of writing up the details of, of our architecture. So at some point we'll have a write up if you're interested in seeing all of the gory details of how the app works. <coughs> um, so yeah, so let me just kind of, uh, yeah, so that's sort of our forward private version. Uh, okay, so yeah, so this I, this I don't want to skip. So this is um, the leakage. So we leak, or our scheme, our encrypted search solution leaks two things. It leaks the search pattern and the access pattern. Um, so intuitively, what the search pattern means is that our servers are going to see if your query is repeated, okay? So if you search, if you search for bear three times, we're going to know that you search for something three times. We're not going to know what, okay? But we know that uh, you search for something three times, for the same thing three times, okay? Um, and the access pattern, what that means is essentially that we, when you do a search, if you search for bear, we know that these three encrypted pictures that we're sending back, that they contain something um, in common, right? So we know that these three encrypted pictures that we're sending back to you are related to your search query. We don't know what that search query is, but, but you know, there's sort of a bit of information. Of course, the question is, what is the consequence of this leakage, right? What is the implication of this? Um, you know, it's not a sort of easy question to answer, but basically one way to try and, and give some intuition about it is to say that, you know, in order, to, in order for us to actually see your pictures, we would have to break AES, okay? So clearly, I mean, you know, um, we like to think we're, we're pretty good cryptographers, but we're not that good, right? So um, the other thing, is that if we wanted to learn information about your queries, at least with the state of the art, which is kind of this counting attack, um, the cache at all, uh, if we want to know something about your queries, we would have to know about 90% of your tags. So either we'd have to guess them, or we would have to somehow find out 90% of the tags that your client, that your PicSec client has generated. And we would also have to know the occurrence of each of those tags. So how many times this tag has been associated um, to a picture, okay? so you know, how likely is it that we can do this? You know, from our point of view, we think it's pretty unlikely, um, but we just want to make sure that everybody is aware of it so that if you somehow think that we can guess most of your tags and we can guess the occurrence, then, you know, if you're worried about that, then you shouldn't use the app, okay? So, um, yeah, so the last sort of uh, point I wanted to make is that, um, you know, this is, so the app is really just kind of in testing phase, right? So we need your help. It's available on Google Play. It's only available on Android. Um, right now, it's not sort of, uh, not everybody can get it. You have to sort of uh, be registered to be able to, to download it. So if you're interested, you can send us a message on Twitter, uh, PicSec app, uh, send us a message and we'll sort of add your, add your name and you can download the app um, and play around with it. And you know, we'd be really grateful for any feedback uh, feedback related to usability, feedback related to design, any kind of thing that, um, that you can think of uh, will be greatly appreciated. So yeah, this is um, the website, pixsec.io, and again, the, the Twitter name, handle, um, if, you, if you want to get in touch. Thank you. Yeah, questions? Thanks, Sammy. Um, so one of the examples you gave is uh, search for the photos taken in summer 2013. So how flexible is your query language? Can you literally say summer 2013 and it'll search a date range or do you have to have tagged every picture with 2013, summer 2013, August 2013, and August 29, 2013? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now, it's not flexible at all. So basically it's single keyword search. You just have to say, you know, bear or like lamp and that's it. Um, now, there, there, are a lot, there, there are schemes um, 
in the literature, some that we've designed, some that other people have designed, that are more flexible, where you can say like some, you know, you can have Boolean queries, basically, so ands, ors, et cetera. And um, those are actually, like now we're at a point where those are efficient, like really efficient, so we could actually implement those. Uh, we haven't done so yet. Now, the caveat is that those schemes, even though they're more flexible and they're very efficient, they leak more, right? So this is sort of always this trade-off. So we sort of haven't made a decision yet as to like where we're gonna go, right? And, and that can be also feedback that you can give us, you know, like, um, you know, we, we think the leakage is reasonable, but, but you know, that leakage, the, the leakage profile of the Boolean schemes hasn't been analyzed as much as the leakage profiles of the single keyword search schemes. So, and, and dates in particular are more like range schemes. Yes, exactly. So, so that's another great question, also another great area of research. Um, range queries, this is an area that's sort of evolving. So um, clearly it's a very useful functionality. We have, there have been some constructions published on range queries. There also have been very recent attacks. Kenny has a, uh, a paper um, at Oakland that breaks um, many of them. Um, so, you know, the, the, the jury is still out on range queries. We, we actually have some work in progress that, it, you know, that is not susceptible to Kenny's attacks. Um, but, you know, this is an evolving problem. Right. Great. Yeah. Hey, Sunny, thanks a lot for this work. Uh, I use Google Photos, and God help me if my library ever gets hacked. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, I had one question about the password uh, mechanism. So it seems that you derive a secret key from a password, and then you encrypt everything with that secret key. Is that at a high level how things work? Uh, n not, no, not, not quite. So basically, the, uh, we generate a random, a random key, and that's the key that we use to encrypt and the key that we use for the encrypted data structures. I mean, we, have, you know, we then derive multiple keys. And then we encrypt that key um, using a password-derived right. key on the device. So our assumption is that your device right, is going to be secure. Right? Um, but the keys that we use with the server, with anything that's related to the server, those are real keys. They're not password-derived. So we can't like, you know, so, so some, somebody that's trying to like fish you, for example, right, there's no, there's no password that they can derive or that they can get mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. They would have to actually compromise your device. Sure, so, so yeah, my question was if I lose my password or I crack my device, I'm, I'm, I, I basically lose access to my photos? Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. So we have kind of a, so we, we have a recovery mechanism. Essentially your, um, that key, that random key, not, the pa not password generated, that random key, is encrypted using the answers to your security questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that is backed up in the cloud, mm -hmm. right? So if you have good security questions or you know, with reasonable entropy, then you'll be okay. If you don't, what's gonna happen is that an adversary or, or we would have to sort of, um, we would have, an adversary would have to recover that encryption um, and guess your recovery, sure. your recovery answers, or break your device. Sure. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yep. Hey, Sonny. Hey. So one quick uh, c comment, clarification about your New York Times uh, quote. Mm. That kind of oh. sounds like it was a deliberate thing not to encrypt uh, stuff. Uh -huh. And in fact, the, so the credentials were encrypted. The reason was, you know, unprotected servers. Even if stuff was encrypted, the keys were compromised. So. Okay. Right. So, so you, could, you could still search on, you know, mail or whatever and push ads, having uh, encrypted credentials. Okay. But, you know, that, okay. it's out of context, that quote. Right. I mean, so no, no, not blaming you. No, no, I'm going gonna, gonna to write a letter to the New York Times and <laughs> tell them, you know, thanks. Hi. Uh, so I think you didn't mention where the TensorFlow model would run. Uh, so that's the model, right, to, to actually detect the tags, say, uh, in the, to predict the tags from the picture. Now, it seems to me that if it run on the client, well, that would be oh. quite inefficient. Oh, yeah, yeah. And awesome. if it run on the cloud, then you would leak essentially the picture, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great question, thanks. So, right, so the machine learning algorithm is running on your phone, okay? So it's not being sent to Google or being sent to IBM. Uh, to, you know, with like Watson or something to do. So that's, that's completely local to your phone. Um, so this is using TensorFlow Mobile, which is the mobile version of TensorFlow that's optimized for phones. Right. 
and, and that's that's efficient from from your experience. Yeah. 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 I mean, of course, I'm, you know, so I'm not a machine learning expert, but clearly uh, my guess is there's some trade-offs between efficiency and machine learning, you know, as well, and the quality of the tags, right, but sort of, yeah. So if I have an accident and I get to coma and I, uh, I uh, wake up in 20 years and Pixel doesn't exist anymore, did I lose my photos? Uh, so, yeah, if you're in a coma and if, like, all of us, you know, get hit by a bus. Yeah, I think you're, you may be, you may be in trouble, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't hear, but yeah. There, there's, there's, you know, there, there's some probability that like, we'll all die tomorrow because of something that <laughs> like, that Donald Trump did. So, you know, I don't know, but yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers for the session.